Hello. If there's one thing the Egyptians were good at, it was building. And the Pharaoh Ramesses was the best builder of them all. Egypt is covered with his monuments, and today we're going to take a closer look at them. Behind me here is perhaps the most remarkable one of all, Abel Simbel. They're all statues of Ramesses, and they're each over 20 meters high. That's four times as high as a double-decker bus. But that's not all. Can you see down at the bottom? There's a door. Let's go and explore. Doesn't look such a small door now, does it? Look. And once you go through the door, you find yourself inside a huge temple. Inside, there are more giant statues of Ramesses. And on the walls, there are pictures of some of his victories. Here he is riding into battle on his chariot. And there's his favorite animal, a tame lion running along beside him. And here he is raising his club and grabbing a bunch of them by the hair to finish them off. All this was to show the people what a mighty pharaoh Ramesses was. And you might think from this that the temple was built in his honor, but it wasn't. Strictly speaking, it was built in honor of the sun god, Ra. That's his statue up there between the big statues of Ramesses. And at the back of the temple, there are more statues to the sun god. The temple faces towards the east and the rising sun, and is positioned in such a way that twice a year, the rays of the rising sun shine through the door and light up the statues at the back. And here's another of Ramesses' monuments. It's a huge stone pillar known as an obelisk. And like the temple at Abu Simbel, the obelisk was put up partly in honor of the sun god and partly in honor of this man. Who is it? Ramesses. The sides of the obelisk are covered in that strange writing we told you about in the last program, hieroglyphs. They look as though they were carved yesterday, don't they? But they're thousands of years old. And most of the writing is telling everyone what a wonderful person Ramesses is. We've made our own obelisk out of old boxes. We've taped them together and we've placed a pyramid shape on the top, just like the ones in Egypt. And we've covered the sides in hieroglyphs. This is my name. And this is Ravens. And this, the name of the series, Watch. You could make an obelisk like this. I think there'd be just enough room for all your names. Our obelisk is nice and light. We can move it about because it's made of old boxes, you see. But real obelisks were made out of a single piece of stone, and they were very, very heavy. Which do you think was heavier, an obelisk or a London bus? Well, an obelisk was. In fact, some obelisks were heavier than a hundred buses put together. And the amazing thing is that the Egyptians would sometimes move the obelisks hundreds of miles from the quarries where they'd dug the stone out to the place where they put the obelisk up. For much of the journey, they could put it on a boat and tow it up the Nile. That was quite easy. But what about the bits when they had to move it overland? Remember, they didn't have any cranes or lorries to help them. All they had was their muscles, some rope, and some things called rollers. Now, here's how the rollers work. If I try and push this brick along with my little finger, Oh, it's really quite hard work. I, I can't really move it at all. But if I put the brick on these cardboard rollers, I just give it a push, and look, away it goes. <laughs> and that's really just all the Egyptians would do with their obelisks. They'd drag them along on a track of rollers that had been greased with animal fat. As long as you have enough people working for you, you can move very heavy weights this way. And the Egyptians were never short of laborers. The Egyptians don't make obelisks anymore, but some of their building methods have hardly changed at all. 
These men, for example, live in modern Egypt and are making bricks. These men are also making bricks 4,000 years ago. As Louise found out, the same methods are still used today and they still work very well. Most of the buildings we've been looking at have been made of stone. But when Ramesses wanted to build a new city, he would have used these sort of bricks. They're mud bricks. Now, to make mud bricks is very easy in Egypt. You take the black earth from the banks of the River Nile, and then you make it into mud by adding water and straw. Let's go and see how they do it. The earth is taken away to a shed and dumped into a trough. Water is sprinkled on to turn it into mud. And then a man throws on some chopped straw. The straw helps to bind the bricks together and makes them stronger. When the mud has been mixed, it is piled onto carts and hauled away by donkeys to the place where they will turn it into bricks. Now comes the final stage. The mud is lifted off the cart and placed in wooden moulds, which are themselves shaped like bricks. Then the moulds are turned upside down and out come the bricks each one with a maker's stamp on it. <laughs> Last of all, they are left to dry. And after a day in the sun, the bricks are ready for use. You could make some mud bricks for your classroom museum and build yourself a little wall. As you see, it's very simple. First, you just need some earth and add water and mix it into mud. Now, if you want to do the job properly, you must mix in some chopped up straw or grass as well. Then we have to put it into a mould. Now, I've used an empty tea packet here, and I've put some tape round the edges to strengthen it. There we are. Now, if you want to make a good job of it, you should stamp it to show who the brick belongs to. Now, these bricks belong to me, so I'm going to stamp them with the Egyptian hieroglyph for R. That's the first letter of my name. Let's see what it looks like on paper first, so you can see clearly. Here we are. Now you stamp the bricks while they're still damp. See it? And when they're dry, they come out looking like this. There, you see that? Now, if you go to the British Museum, you can see a mud brick there that was made in the time of Ramesses. You can just see Ramesses' stamp on the top there. See? And if you look very closely, look, there's bits of straw sticking out the edges there. And talking of Ramesses, let's get back to the story, shall we? Well, the years had gone by and Moses had grown from a boy into a strong young man. He still lived at the palace with the Egyptians, but deep in his heart and deep in his bones, he knew that he didn't belong to them. Who he was and where he came from, he had no idea. But he knew that the Egyptians were not his people. One day, he saw an Israelite slave gang toiling away in the quarries. He'd often seen this happening, of course, but this time it was somehow different. As the Israelites sweated away, they sang a sad song about their troubles. And as Moses watched and listened, the truth suddenly dawned on him. He knew by their faces and their movements and their voices that these were his own people. This was what he was. He was an Israelite. One of the Israelites was working on his own. And as he watched, Moses saw the slave master strike him to the ground. As the Israelite lay there helpless, the slave master continued to beat him savagely. Moses was filled with blind rage. Without thinking, he rushed in to defend the Israelite. But Moses was too full of anger, and he fought too hard. When the fight was over, the Egyptian lay dead in the sand. Moses was shocked at what he had done, 
and he looked around to see if anyone had seen. It seemed that no one had noticed, so Moses hastily buried the Egyptian in the sand and went away. But someone had seen. Next day, Moses saw two Israelites fighting in the street, and he tried to separate them. But the first Israelite just laughed at him. Who are you to tell us not to fight? We saw you murder the Egyptian. You wait till the Pharaoh hears about it. When Ramesses the Pharaoh did get to hear about it, he was very angry. Who is this Moses who has killed my officer? Bring him to me that I may have him put to death. When Moses heard that, he realized that he must flee, and he ran away to a distant land called Midian. Midian was very different from Egypt. It was dry and dusty, but there was just enough food for sheep and goats, and Moses became a shepherd. He soon grew used to the life, and he would spend all his days on the mountainside tending his flocks, just as these people are doing. Well, the years went by, and that, you might think, was the end of the story. But somehow Moses could never quite forget his people slaving away in Egypt under the cruel Pharaoh Ramesses. And one day, something happened that was to change everything. As he wandered on the mountainside, Moses saw an amazing sight. There in front of him was a, a burning bush. Huge flames leaped out of the heart of it, and it lit up the mountain more brightly than the sun. But the strangest thing about it was that although the fire blazed and raged, none of the bush was destroyed by it. The flames were like gorgeous flowers blooming on the mountainside, and they burned nothing away. Moses could hardly believe his eyes, but as he approached it, a loud voice called out to him, Moses, Moses, come no nearer, for this is holy ground you are standing on. Then Moses knew that it was a voice of God speaking to him from the burning bush, and he was afraid. But God said, do not be frightened. I have heard of the troubles of your people, and I have chosen you to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. But how can I return to Egypt, said Moses? Ramesses will kill me if I do. There is no need to fear, Ramesses, said God, for Ramesses has died, and a new pharaoh is on the throne. And if the new pharaoh is still harsh to you, then I shall be harsh to him, so that in the end, however long it takes, he will let you go. And then, Moses, you will lead the Israelites into the new land I have set apart for them, a rich, beautiful land of their own, a land flowing with milk and honey. Go now, Moses, and return to your people. So Moses took up his staff and returned to the land of Egypt. Moses saw a bush in the desert that burned with a steady flame. And the voice spoke out of the burning bush. It was calling out his name. Hear my message, hear me, Moses. There's no need to fear me, Moses. It is you I choose, must not refuse. Hear my message, hear. Somewhere a country is waiting far, far away. Somewhere a country awaits you, your home someday. I, Jehovah, swear that it's true that somewhere a land is waiting for you, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land for you. Somewhere a country awaits you, your resting place. Someday you will behold it, your Milk and honey, a land flowing with milk 
Goodbye.